right, so it's uh, one o'clock on January 11th and we'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, meeting. Uh, I'm Owen Foster and today we have a presentation relating to our health resource allocation plan. We have an update on that. Uh, our Director of Health Systems Finances, Sarah Lindbergh, will discuss the hospital budget reboot and consideration of changing the hospital finance reporting to a bi-yearly bi schedule. Um, for logistical purposes, we're going to take numbers three and four out of order today. So after we do the health resource allocation plan, we'll then turn to the consideration of changing the hospital finance reporting period. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, our executive director, Susan Barrett, for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I have a scheduling update. Uh, first, um, for next year, next week, I want to let everyone know that our meeting will be starting at 2 p.m., our board meeting. Um, at that meeting, we're going to continue the education that we're providing to the board, the newer board members, and also the public on our regulatory work and background um, on that work. And next week, we're going to hear from some national experts on rural financial health. Um, so that that will be very interesting and very helpful to the board as you continue to do your work on um, hospital budget oversight. We'll also have our own Green Mountain Care Board staff update the board and others and the public and stakeholders on the work that we received last year as part of Act 167. And that um, that presentation will fo focus on the hospital sustainability work um, as well as some of the payment work that we received last year and um, reviewing uh, the Act 167 language as well as giving you any updates as to where we are with that work. So reminder, we start at 2 p.m. next week. And then also to remind um, everyone, as I do every week, that we are accepting any public comments regarding uh, the next potential LPR model. As I've mentioned in the past, uh, the governor and the Agency of Human Services are leading the work on the current all payer model as well as the negotiations for the next all payer model. So uh, if we do receive those, we share those comments with those parties. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Oh, Chair Foster, you're on mute. Oh, thank you. It's ironic because I was just asking people uh, on the that are attending to mute their phones, <laughs> and meanwhile I was muted. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're calling in or, or observing um, for now, could just mute your phones because we're getting a little bit of background noise here and there. Um, and later we'll have public comment. You can unmute if if needed. Um, and with that, our last board hearing was December twenty first, um, twenty twenty two, and uh, we have board meeting minutes to review and approve. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from December 21st, 2022? So moved. Um, second. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the vote is unanimous and the minutes are approved from December 21st, 2022. Um, next, I'll turn to two staff members, uh, Jessica Mendisable, who is our data project director here at the Green Mountain Care Board, and also Veronica Fialkowski, who is our director of data analysis and management here at the board. Um, Ms. Mendisable, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Chair Foster. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction and Veronica is actually going to present the slides today, but um, I have uh, been with the board um, for uh, just over four years now and started working on the health resource allocation plan when I came. So I have a lot of historical context and just wanted to um, set the stage for today. Uh, the purpose of this presentation today is really just an opportunity to provide um, some background on the work that's been done to date, provide some education to our new board members and members of the public, as well as stakeholders um, that are maybe just tuning in or as we're all coming back to um, a new phase of this work. Um, 
we uh, we have done quite a bit of work on health resource planning, and that work is available uh, and accessible on our website. But uh, I'll just emphasize that uh, a revised health resource allocation plan is not complete. So no, there's no full plan. So I just wanted to say that up front. Um, but work has been underway for several years um, in various capacities, and Veronica is going to speak to that today. Um, as always, we welcome feedback from stakeholders and members of the community that are doing work around resource planning. I think one of the things we learned really early on is that there's a tremendous amount of work taking place at the community level around resource planning. And um, to the extent that we've been aware of that, we've tried to highlight that in the previous years. I'll just say um, it's probably not everything. And so if there's work um, that's underway and, and you want to highlight that, um, please reach out to myself or Veronica or, or Susan, and um, we're happy to uh, to highlight that work and, and consider it as part of our work. Um, with, and, you know, we really trust um, the, the work that's taking place and, and want to be a part of that. So. Um, and uh, as Veronica will mention, we're continuing to engage stakeholders throughout the next phase of this process. And so I'll just turn it over to Veronica and let her kind of take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so everyone should see some slides. Um, so today we'll be presenting on the health resource allocation plan and throughout the presentation, I'll refer to it as a trap. So um, the goal of today's presentation is really to provide an overview of what ATRAP is um, and the purpose, um, ATRAP evolution, you know, what, what is, a, where, 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 you know, what was ATRAP, what is ATRAP today, and then that will set us up nicely to talk about the ATRAP future in the next updating cycle. Um, so 18 VSA 9405 requires Green Mountain Care Board to develop and maintain the ATRAP. It was established by legislature in 2003 and then updated in 2018, which we will review what those updated, updates included later in the presentation. ATRAP legislation requires an inventory of speci um, specified services and resources, and those include um, hospital, nursing home, other inpatient services, ambulatory care, um, mental health services, health screening, et cetera, home health services, emergency care, and then also health resources, which may include personnel, equipment, and then infrastructure for social determinants of health. Um, legislation also requires recommendations for the appropriate supply and distribution of healthcare services and for the ATRAP to be updated every year. And I think there's some feedback, so folks can mute. Um, I, this is taken right out of statute, but I think it obviously summarizes really nicely what ATRAP is, so I just wanted to um, present it here. So the purpose of ATRAP is to identify Vermont's critical health needs, goods, services, and resources, which shall be used to inform the board's regulatory processes, cost containment, and statewide quality of care efforts, healthcare payment and delivery reform initiatives, and any allocation of health resources in the state. And the ATRAP shall identify those Vermont, Vermont residents' needs for healthcare services, programs, and facilities, the resources that are currently available, and then what additional resources would be required to realistically meet those needs to make access to those services, programs, et cetera. So ATRAP really should bring a variety of information from internal and external partners to provide the snapshot of our Vermont's health needs what we currently have in terms of resources and equipment on those gaps. And it's really for informing the board's regulatory processes, including certificate of need, hospital budget, et cetera. It's for hospitals and healthcare providers and entities to support of, of the legislative process, the public, um, et cetera. Many types of audiences for what ATRAP is. So I think that when we discuss the ATRAP evolution, it'll also help kind of define what ATRAP is and show. Um, and so we'll, there, here's a timeline of kind of this evolution and we'll go through each um, of the kind of segments of this timeline. 
So first, um, as already stated, the legislature, legislature established ATRAP in 2003. The first ATRAP was published in 2005, and there was an updated ATRAP published in 2009. So the old ATRAP um, was a static report. Um, the most recent of the static reports that was published in 2009 have sections that included kind of a general overview of what ATRAP is, and then sections on ambulatory services, mental health services, long-term care services, et cetera. And then each of those sections um, included recommendation of resource allocation, and it was also almost 200 pages long. <laughs> I think the 2005 ATRAP was almost 500 pages long, so a big report. Um, in 2017, there was numerous stakeholder meetings um, in middle of the year to talk about kind of what are the visions for a proposal for revising ATRAP to legislature. And so um, from those stakeholder meetings, um, what was determined is that um, the proposal would be to move away from this static inventory and report and to also utilize more existing data sources. Um, and so this was taken in and updated in 2018, um, and that statute went into effect then. Um, and you will later see kind of the importance of utilizing all sorts of data sources for this. So this new kind of four year cycle, I guess we can call it, um, started in 2019. There was um, stakeholder engagements, um, a transition to a web based ATRAP um, and the ATRAP resources, healthcare resource inventories where the gathering was conducted, um, and then many different reports that kind of make the ATRAP were updated, including patient migration, utilization, um, assessments, et cetera. Um, I think it's also important to show that in this time frame, the COVID-19 pandemic response was happening in parallel to all of this work. And so just keep that in mind as we talk about all the work that has been done um, during this time frame. So ATRAP today is really a series of dynamic reports, visualizations, and other user-friendly tools designed to convey information um, these tools are all on our board's website, which I'll review in a minute. ATRAP identifies healthcare services and gaps in, the, in availability and accessibility and considers the underlying health needs across communities in Vermont. And Green Mountain Care Board continues to analyze healthcare needs and resources and utilization patterns um, to help support those regulatory decisions. So ATRAP data sources, I sometimes hear when we talk about ATRAP, like this one data source for ATRAP, but that's really not what we have. It's um, many data sources, health data sources across the state. The many entities like Jessica earlier said um, across the state are conducting work that help us understand the current resources, needs and gaps that we have. And so the ATRAP should include <laughs> reports from many partners, including us here at the Green Mountain Care Board, the Health Department, VAS, Viva, et cetera. Um, so Vermont has many data resources, databases, et cetera, which, measure, which can be used to measure and evaluate the supply, distribution, and cost of healthcare services in Vermont. Um, just to note, Green Mountain Care Board does steward two of those health data resources, the um, hospital discharge data set and the all payers, all payer claims data set. Um, and those two data sources can be used to understand some of these, but the, uh, it has to be supplemented through other health data resources that we have in the state. So it really is a collaborative process. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board has worked with stake stakeholders throughout this whole process. Um, early stages included conversations on statewide planning already underway, priority areas to consider, as well as format and presentation discussions. We learned very quickly that measurement of need is highly nuanced, and often the gaps lie with workforce and care coordination. And we realized that planning for these areas during the pandemic is highly challenging. And so we focused our efforts on analysis relevant to the board's work related to sustainability and you know, utilization patterns, which was a lot of what the ATRAP work 
was during this four year cycle. This is a pretty simple visualization, but it's how I like to think of what ATRAP is. It's really, you know, all these data resources, um, health resources, equipment, inventories, needs assessment, community profiles, healthcare utilization analysis, patient migration, et cetera, um, that kind of come together to make what we, you know, uh, refer to as ATRAP. Um, this is our ATRAP website, which can be found on the Green Mountain Care Board um, pages. Um, it's currently organized by healthcare resources, which include the inventories, community needs, and assessments, many of which are conducted by our partners um, at, at the health department, AHS, et cetera, and then a number of public reports, many of which are done by Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, the resources that are currently available are kind of a mix of static maps and reports. So for example, this, I took a random example, um, oral health care inventory. And so here's a static map on the left of just the dental care services across the state. And then um, a couple of snapshots of more um, interactive or dynamic reports in uh, dashboards for patient understanding patient migration and then primary health care access. Um, recent updates from for this kind of ATRAP cycle, and this list is not exhaustive. This is just a few things that um, have recently been updated. Um, includes the patient migration analysis, which is done by Green Mountain Care Board. Um, there's a new hospital market report, which formerly was the patient origin report that the Green Mountain Care Board did. But now hosp the hospital market report is done by Boz. Um, Blueprint community health profile data is updated. Um, and then the healthcare inventories, um, which were conducted in 2019 and 2020. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, just an example of a few items. So that's where we're at today and kind of looking and so we're gonna start talking about the future. Um, there has been work that started in 2022 to think about the future, which is requirements gathering uh, for the ATRAP update for understanding how um, our uh, Green Mountain Care Board regulatory processes use ATRAP and how their work kind of can help uh, influence or update what ATRAP is as well. It's definitely a, it's definitely a, a kind of a goes both way updating. So ATRAP fusion, uh, future vision, process, and goals. So the vision, I wouldn't say it's different than what we already know of ATRAPs to be, but I think it's important to consider it as we think about the future. So ATRAP should capture what is happening in the state in terms of healthcare accessibility, quality, and cost, and how we want to allocate our healthcare resources. We want to deliver up-to-date, sustainable, and dynamic resources that enables more informed health resource allocation decision-making across Vermont using data. We want to focus on the needs of each regulatory process at the Green Mountain Care Board, for example, certificate of need. We want to provide ad hoc analysis for different needs and questions that arise that are not captured by the current ATRAP. It's impossible for us to be able to tie a nice bow about every single need um, or resource or gap that we have in healthcare in Vermont, but having, be, having the ability to do ad hoc analysis to fill those as needed is important. We want to foster a collaborative process. Um, so this goes back to that collaboration of all the partners that we have to work with um, for ATRAP. Um, many of the work is being done outside of Green Mountain Care Board. So we just want to have a process that um, is inclusive of using um, and leveraging the, the work that's already being done. Um, and then develop a tool that allows for navigation out to a variety of reports completed by all these partners um, by health service area to understand the resources and needs. So how do we package that data or information? Um, I think it's important to think of this whole process as ongoing. There's not really a, we start here and this is the final product. It's um, 
always in a, an ongoing updated process. So, you know, we can start with requirements gathering, for example, what we're doing now with the Green Mountain Care Board regulatory processes. Um, we need to do stakeholder engagement. We need to consider data collection, analysis, reporting. And then how are we gonna visualize and package that information and then keep going? Um, this is true for all of HRAP. This is true for specific priorities of HRAP, et cetera. Um, so some consideration, so kind of the structure in terms of how are we gonna you know, update or choose priorities for the next ATRAP. So there's gonna be a new state health improvement plan. Um, so that should be utilized to guide some of those decisions. Um, again, those Green Mountain Care Board regulatory needs that are happening through the requirements gathering. Um, that stakeholder engagement, we wanna revise the process to ensure work across the state is included. Um, we need to ensure that we're providing recommendations for resource allocation and then the visualization, how to package the data on the web page to make sure it's meeting the needs of everyone. So this is just a little bit of a kind of, if you will, a roadmap, um, a, a light roadmap maybe of goals and next steps. Um, so some of this will be a little repetitive, but um, we wanna finalize the Green Mountain Care Board regulatory process requirements gathering. We need to communicate the stakeholder engagement process determine a process to enhance the ability to provide ad hoc analysis not captured by the ATRAP. Um, I think this one is really important is to explore more sustainable ways to update resource inventories and collect data from hospitals in the least burdensome way. Um, you know, not only do we want this to be useful, but we also want it to be sustainable and um, everyone is busy, pandemic response or not. And so, you know, how, how do we collect this information? A uh, developed process for providing resource allocation recommendations. Who's gonna provide those recommendations? How, how will they exist? When will they be updated? And then map when and how ATRAP components are updated. So because the ATRAP includes many different resources, analyses, assessments, et cetera, um, all of those are updated on a different cycle or for a one-time uh, analyses and not, are not recurrent. So I think understanding that and being transparent and mapping it out will uh, enhance what ATRAP is. And then just a reminder again that this is an ongoing process and there's really not a finish line, but we can continue to work to make ATRAP as useful and sustainable as possible. All I had. Um, excuse me, Chair Foster, this is Susan Barrett. Apparently, there is a problem with the link and there are folks who are on another link. So I was I was hopeful we could just pause here. I have um, a staff member trying to get them on the correct link. Sure, of course. Okay. Um, you mean the link to this to this webcast? This board meeting, there's a another faulty link um, in I have Marissa Melamed over there who's trying to get them over here. So maybe we can just pause for a moment. Sure. Marissa, we take... oh. Marissa just gave the right link. So I was <laughs> one of the people over there was clicking on the link in the monthly agenda as opposed okay. to the link in the daily agenda. I am so sorry. We will make sure that we address that. Um, Chair Foster, should we just Give it a few moments for folks to. Yeah, we'll give it. Well, we, okay. we'll just give it five minutes. We have. Okay. We'll give it five minutes. We'll come back at one thirty. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um. So we had a technical issue with one of the links, and some of the folks who wanted to hear and potentially public comment on the HRAP presentation weren't able to attend, and we think it's important that they do. Um, so we're going to take a little out of order today, even more out of order, and we're going to do the hospital, sorry, the consideration of changing hospital finance reporting to bi yearly. Then we're going to do the hospital budget reboot, and then we will have round two of the HRAP update. And we apologize for this, but we thought that given the number of stakeholders wanted to participate, it was important to do it and give them the opportunity to hear it and comment. 
Um, and so we're going to do that. And I apologize again for the, the glitch, but thanks for your patience. It's a new year and we had vacation and getting back up to speed here. So thank you. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, Sarah Lindbergh, our uh, Director of Health System Finances. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, are folks able to see my screen? Great. Um, so uh, I'm here to chat with you about uh, the upcoming uh, or a proposed change uh, to the uh, reporting for fiscal year uh, 23. So we'll just kick it off here and uh, the <clears throat> current way that we're doing the reporting is we have uh, three financial uh, monitoring, uh, or I'm sorry, our, we're proposing three financial monitoring periods, essentially uh, two interim and a final. Uh, right now we're requiring five within the fiscal year and uh, because the even now that we're post COVID, the numbers are, are looking a little bit more stable. We feel like that might be overkill and it might be time to flex back to kind of some of that um, earlier time uh, timeline of further reporting. Um, the advantages of this proposal would be reducing some of the burden uh, of these filings on our regulated entities. And also, as we look to make changes to our budget process, it might um, free up some time for them to uh, deal with some of those uh, changes in the uh, to prepare for the fiscal year 24 uh, reporting. Um, the potential con that I see is that there is a possibility that it would uh, increase the time that uh, the Green Mountain Care Board be, would learn of a financial problem. Um, we do have plenty of other um, resources uh, and are using those for our financially vulnerable hospitals. So I, I think that this is probably a, a low uh, probability outcome and would violate other conditions of the budget order. Um, and we'll walk through that together. So. Uh, the, the leftmost column is showing some things that won't change <laughs> based on this proposal. Uh, we get uh, we get um, uh, updated hospital budget filings uh, in October. We get audited financials in January. We will get the next fiscal year uh, budget filings uh, in July. And uh, right now uh, we're expecting those uh, federal 990 filings as well as the community health needs assessments in September. So that this proposal would not touch any of that. Um, but if you look at how the current uh, proposal does, so the October, November and December, the Q1 filing, um, as well as the, the prior year actuals are currently due January 31st. And then we have filings April 30th, July 31st and October 31st. And as you can see, there's already filings due um, for same, some of these same time periods. Um, what it would look like to change this to kind of biannual, biannual monitoring with a final report would be have them report their um, October to February actuals by March 31st, um, having those prior year actuals due um, in December, and that would include the July through um, September uh, months, but we would see the March through June, um, July 31st, which would be kind of integrated in the hospital budget uh, proceeding. So um, July, they there's a big filing, usually July 1st, uh, and then that would give a little time for them to focus on that uh, for that second filing. Um, just to remind you folks, uh, these are some of the other conditions that allow us to do additional monitoring as needed. So um, telephonic check-ins uh, that we have discretion to schedule. Um, right now we meet quarterly with the UVM Health Network and we're meeting monthly with Springfield Hospital. Um, and so, you know, if there are other hospitals that um, seem to have some financial vulnerabilities, we can call regular or um, ad hoc meetings as needed. Um, hospitals are to advise the board of any material changes to its uh, budgeted revenue or expenses or assumptions in its budget. So they already are supposed to inform us about that off cycle if there's a, a material change. Um, they also are um, going to be participating in our strategic sustainability planning process, um, and that's going to start to ramp up here. And so I think that that also will involve a lot of um, uh, data attention <laughs> that uh, they might uh, be better spent on that project than quarterly filings. 
Um, and then, you know, we also have a very broad condition about um, timely filing of all forms required by us. So, you know, that's one of the things that we are going to be thinking about for the 24 guidance is making sure that we're incentivizing um, timely filings. Um, and if we're getting them less often, that timeliness becomes even more important. Um, so that is the proposal. Uh, Russ drafted a suggested motion if you choose to uh, adopt it, but uh, I'm here for questions. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, with that, we'll turn it over to any board discussion or comments. Do any board members have any board questions members, or comments? Any I have a couple Hello. questions. Oh. You go ahead, Jess. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you. So uh, my first question is the the con that you mentioned, Sarah. You know that it may increase the time before the GMCB would learn of financial problems. Um, and I'm wondering if we can mitigate that risk somehow. And I recognize that we have these alternative methods for monitoring, but I'm just wondering, would it make sense to impose a day's cash on hand trigger that if the day's cash on hand falls below some critical threshold, then that specific hospital might have to revert back to quarterly reporting until the day's cash on hand then exceed that, thresh that threshold. Does, there, does that make sense to mitigate that risk of, this, of the con? I think you might be on mute though. Going around today. Uh, I, I think if that scenario that, yeah, the additional uh, oversight is warranted and whether that be through financial reporting on a you know month uh, quarterly basis or something similar to the monthly meetings we have with some hospitals. Um, yeah, I, I think that that makes sense. Uh, and then my second question just was, uh, with that timeline that you laid out, we we put the non-financial reporting, um, you know, on quality and access on the back burner during COVID to alleviate some of the, you know, admin burden for hospitals that were, you know, trying to manage the pandemic. And I'm just wondering what's your current thinking on, uh, you know, what non-financial data the board might resume requesting monitoring and how that might fit into this new timeline? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question, and I think that that's part of um, what we'll talk about in the next presentation. But like, yeah, let's make sure that um, the things that we're expecting through the um, financial budgetary process are related to those decisions, and let's figure out a, a more appropriate avenue for the other important things that we need to know about hospitals, but maybe not are directly related to a budget decision. So I think that um, we would want to think about that in terms of any additional requirements in that timeline. Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll visit that in the as we're rebooting the hospital budget process, where that non fin what ne what non financial reporting will be in there, and when and how it fits into this new reporting timeline. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, Chair Foster. Ms. Lunch, did you have any questions or comments? Sure, I had a comment. Um, I like the idea of moving uh, back some of the quarterly reporting. I think. Um, to Jess's point, there are a couple of things that we've instituted pre-COVID to mitigate that same risk of not um, getting timely information, which has occurred once before. Um, and that included ensuring that we had both the executives and the board chair attesting to the information. And also, I think this requirement about reporting, we we got that a little more strict in the budget orders than it had been beforehand. So I feel comfortable that we have the protections in place that should we not get uh, information that we need, that we have ways we could uh, react to that in between these reporting periods. Any other board member questions or comments? Um, I had one which was um, relating to member Holmes's uh, suggestion about a potential day's cash on hand trigger. Um, Sarah Lindbergh, do you, do you have a sense of what that number would be or how should we go about assessing or thinking about what that number should be if it's something the board wants to consider? Absolutely. Um... 
I think that that's exactly the kind of like objective financial benchmark that we're looking to build into the new process. So I, I, I'm hesitant to kind of shoot from the hip and uh, <laughs> uh, to set something here. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, that's something that we can take as homework and, and bring back before the board or um, just uh, uh, I think the, the tricky thing at the moment is uh, the entire United States hospital sector is in really rough shape. Um, uh, so what the right uh, relative indicator is might be a little uh, more challenging than your average fiscal year. So, um, okay, I didn't have any other questions or comments um, and I'll turn it over to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments they may have. Happy New Year, uh, Sam Peich, Office of the Healthcare Advocate. It's good to be with all of you. It's been a little while. I've definitely missed the board meeting, I have to admit. Um, we don't. Ha we support this. I think it's a reasonable change, and I think uh, the concerns that um, I think you already prepared for the potential concerns around reporting um, outside of that time, but I think those are mitigated, um, and that's Shiloh, my young one. Um, so I think we're I think we're supportive of this, and uh, thank you to Sarah for all the work you've done on this so far. Great, thank you very much and hello to Shiloh. Um, uh, and with that, we'll turn it over to any public comment. Um, again, as usual, use the raise your hand function and I'll try and call on people in the order in which their hands are raised. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Bertrand, please go ahead. Can you hear me okay? I apologize, I don't have my camera today. Yep, perfect, loud and clear, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Nice to meet you, Chair Foster. I'm Jen Bertrand, I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Gifford. I just had a, a quick clarifying question, if you don't mind for Sarah, just, just for the purposes of when our final audit is and what this is applicable to. And, um, is the December 31st deadline applicable to just our preliminary financial reporting? Okay, thank you. That's just what I wanted. And our actuals would still be due on January 31st, correct? Perfect, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. And, and that's great because our audits are still kind of, um, you know, in process at that point. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Great. And nice to meet you too, Ms. Bertrand. Um, Hopefully we'll get to meet in person sometime. Um, uh, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Um, I guess I have a question for the board, which is would the board members prefer to take up the motion now or have further consideration of the potential um, trigger relating to days cash on hand? Or would the board members prefer to incorporate that in the hospital budget uh, review process? I guess my question for Sarah is timing. So um, if we don't vote on this today, does that mean there's a quarterly filing that comes in in the meantime? That's that's my concern. I think we kind of owe this to the regulated entities. Um, uh, yeah, I, I do know that we're going to start talking about uh, guidance in the very near future. Um, I don't know if it, it makes sense to um, formalize that kind of indicator into a more official framework uh, in the future, or um, that that's what I would recommend. I, I want to be, uh, yeah, that that said, uh, the, the hospitals, I think that uh, <laughs> we are, um, yeah, it, it, we also have an actuals of fiscal year 22 coming up, so that might be another opportunity to think about a principle here. Since I'm the one who raised it, I will say that that's fine with me. I just wanted to raise it as a potential, you know, mitigating strategy so that we don't have to worry about your con that you proposed. So it doesn't, you know, I'm comfortable with this motion language here today. And as long as we kind of put a pin in it and think about are there circumstances under which we would want a hospital to report more frequently if, you know, the financial vulnerability reaches a particular level. So I think we can, we can put a pin in that and find a, a different avenue to explore that. Um, 
I'm comfortable with it as well. I mean, of course, it's good practice and, and good judgment by any entities that have acute financial distress to keep us informed, regardless of whether it's formalized. Expect that that would happen. Um, and nonetheless, we're gonna have an opportunity and guidance in connection with our hospital budget review process to formalize it should we should we need to. So I'm comfortable with the motion language as well. Um, at this time, and I'll, I'll go ahead and make the motion. And the motion is I, I move to modify the hospital financial reporting schedule to require hospitals to report mid-year actual results twice per year instead of quarterly with mid-year reporting deadlines at the end of March and the end of June, as presented today by Green Mountain Care Board staff. Um, actual year-end reporting will continue to be due on December 31st. I'll second that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion is unanimous and, and carries. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Lindbergh. Um, and next we will uh, stay with Ms. Lindbergh, uh, who will discuss the hospital budget reboot, which is re somewhat related to what we just talked about. So Sarah, please go ahead. Let me get myself off mute and... Okay. That coming through okay? Okay, great. So uh, I'm here to just kind of brief uh, the board about our current process underway to review our hospital budget regulation. Um, and so the first, <laughs> I, I, I get a lot of comfort from reminding myself of this and, and it helps me um, remember to have a lot of humility uh, with the, the problems we're grappling with. But um, if you, this uh, is a chapter of with that has a brief history of health uh, care reform written by uh, Mr. Hamilton Davis back in, uh, published back in 1999. And it's summarizing findings from a report produced by the Daniels Commission uh, looking at Vermont back in 1975. And some of these findings uh, we're still grappling with, you know, not a, uh, too many specialists, not enough generalists uh, practicing in our state, um, complex uh, administrative structure with high cost devoted to administration. Um, having money flow out of the state. Um, in that case, they were concerned about insurance company profits flowing out of state. Um, widespread variation and utilization patterns of uh, uh, healthcare resources and costs. <laughs> yep. Is there a... Beth, hey, Sarah, I'm still only seeing the first slide. Oh, okay. I don't know <laughs> if that's true for others, but it sounds like you might have moved to it. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, I am. I always appreciate a technical correction. Um, Hardware is not my jam. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, so a lot of variation in utilization patterns and uh, the resources and costs associated with those. Um, defensive me uh, medicine was on the rise, which was um, uh, leading to some malpractice costs. Uh, then, or to mitigate against malpractice costs, and there were. Uh, not a regard to cost and the demand for some of these resources, fragility of the healthcare system in rural areas, and um, a, a dearth of data to plan and monitor the system. So we've we've certainly made progress um, since 1975, but I would say that uh, there's still lots of work to do on these topics. And so um, I always try to keep a long view because I know people much smarter and more equipped and probably more powerful than me have, have tried to solve some of these really intractable issues. And um, I just want to be mindful about kind of the importance of incremental progress in my own work. Um, so as far as the regulation of hospital budgets, I always find it helpful to kind of remember um, from whence we came. So um, there was plenty of activity prior to 1992, but that's kind of where the, the modern uh, reform m machine uh, came together by merging the health uh, Policy Council and the Data Council, as well as the Certificate of Need Board, um, and that all came under the Healthcare Authority, which was um, 
then moved over to, at the time, the Department of Banking's Insurance and Security, and that's what how Bishka was born. Um, and that is when the real authority to limit the hospital budgets came in. So that's really when the state's um, leverage over this process uh, came to be. Um, and then back in 2011, the HCA portion of Bishka kind of broke off to, to start the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and that's the point where Bishka renamed themselves as the Department of Financial Regulation. And so uh, we've been regulating hospital budgets in a pretty similar way um, in that uh, since the 90s. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of the metrics honestly are the same. Uh, however, the whole delivery system is not. <laughs> so we just need to try to remember that. And so that's what part of why um, in taking on this role back in June, um, one of my first, and I think I was pushing <laughs> for this in my prior role even, but um, just a dedicated scope of work to really take a hard look at our regulation of hospital budgets and figure out how we can achieve some, in my judgment, really important goals. Um, and I've listed what they are here, and, and that is developing objective metrics for hospitals' financial health, um, imp improving the way we evaluate hospital performance, um, things like care quality, the access to care, um, the cost efficiency associated with our hospitals, um, looking for other additional opportunities to align our regulatory duties. Um, and this is you know, most painful, I think, when the QHP rate review process and the hospital budget process um, are trying to run on, uh, I don't know, not quite parallel tracks. Um, and then really importantly, just make sure that the process is consistent and predictable on both sides of the equation. So it's only fair that people know how they're going to be judged and that we're um, you know, true to that um, guidance. Um, and if wherever feasible, reduce some of the administrative burden. I, I'm, I'm a strong proponent for better regulation and not necessarily more regulation. And so getting that right amount of oversight, I think is just gonna take some, some careful thought and so just to lay out some of um, the term I've stolen from a colleague here, but essential questions like what are we really kind of trying to do here? Um, this is the list um, that that is just a smattering of many very difficult questions that we're grappling with. But um, some of the ones that I wanted to highlight for you today are that um, how can we better assess access affordability and meaningful outcomes? Um, what do hospitals look like when they're healthy from a financial perspective? Um, what is the information that uh, we should be using to make hospital budget decisions? Um, and what makes more sense um, from a regulatory monitoring perspective? Um, and for those indicators, um, what is it that makes sense to look at a corporate level versus at that individual hospital's level? And what are the benchmarks that we should be comparing them to? And while we're on that topic, what are the comparisons that make sense for all our hospitals and which ones really um, have designated peer groups and do those peer groups change depending on the question that we're looking at? Um, I also think, you know, it's really important to be um, thinking long term about what we do when hospitals exceed or are unable to meet a budget. And so how does that kind of fit into the, the framework? And if we're going to be entertaining the ideas of hospitals bearing more risk, um, what role is there as a regulator for assessing um, the appropriate amount of risk and assessing solvency for a hospital? That's kind of a, a new topic <laughs> uh, to, to delve into. And so uh, I feel very fortunate that we were able to um, award a competitive bid to Mathematica Policy Research. Um, and they have a, a lot of experience uh, that's related to this effort. So they've been working with us on our all-pair model since 2019, working in that same time period um, in Pennsylvania, who's looking at um, paying hospitals in a different way. Um, lots of experience from the state of Maryland, who has a much different approach um, since 2014. Um, that's not the approach that's necessarily going to make sense for Vermont by any means, but uh, it's good to have kind of a landscape of experience. Um, they also uh, are helping out in Washington State uh, with the chart model, um, or had been, um, as well as some help to HRSA um, with their uh, rural emergency hospital um, work, uh, which is a new designation that CMS is going to be rolling out that might make sense for some of our hospitals here in Vermont. So I think that's another really important piece of their experience. 
Um, so we were working with them to outline the goals and methods, um, identify um, process improvements, and really think of some of these key benchmarks. Um, and so this really just says that in a different way. So they're really chunking this about what's really about process. And that's such like our document management has a lot to improve. Some of the things we talked about in the um, feedback from the last uh, process uh, debrief of the last process. How can we make this more efficient, get stuff to you all faster? How can we do a better job of kind of giving you um, executive level information so you really know where to focus your attention? Um, Kind of some of the methodological questions that are highlighted here are, you know, really what are our goals for hospital budget regulation and, and not for board member A, B or C, but what's the role of the Green Mountain Care Board and what is the goal of that process in the current landscape? So a lot's changed. So it's, I think it's a good time to to kind of think through what that what that's going to be and how we therefore want to regulate based on those goals. Um, and then there's just some data questions. So, you know, what data are we collecting? What data should we be collecting? Uh, what what are better or less burdensome data sources so that we can um, reduce some of the administrative burden on our regulated entities as well as for staff members? And so um, they are kind of breaking it up into these pieces. They're all interrelated <laughs> uh, and they're, uh, very mindful of our moving timelines, which time feels like it's moving faster every single day for me. But um, in March is when we're going to have to finalize the guidance for the hospitals so that they when they turn their budgets in on July 1st, we know what to expect and uh, we'll have the hospital budget hearings in August, most likely. Um, I mean, <laughs> we're likely to have hospital budget hearings, and when we do, they will be in August. <laughs> uh, and then October is when we, of course, have to issue the orders um, for the decisions we made by September 15th. So this, this process won't be changing, so it's a very uh, challenging timeline to make some changes. So just to kind of give you a framework for what we're thinking. So right now in the current fiscal year, we're developing those performance measures, including uh, relevant benchmarks and uh, other uh, kind of data sources. Um, and some of those alternative data sources of particular interest are, you know, are there ways that the cost report could give us what we need to know with um, reducing the burden on some of our regulated entities? And I think this last one in my mind is probably the most important. And that's just like really standing up some more um broad-based systematic monitoring of our healthcare system here in vermont so um kind of go into a one-stop shop to kind of get a, the lay of the land um and so for fiscal year 24 um the name of the game will be focus like really what are the the key inputs we need to to make these budget decisions um, and making sure that we're we're staying on ta on target with that. If there's other data collections that need to be stood up um, that maybe aren't as related to the budget, you know, working on that kind of operationally, um, and then you know, doing our part and keep the, uh, assessing the budget filings as they as we say they will be assessed in the guidance. Um, so I think of 24 is, is um, really a, a bridge year. Um, and then in fiscal year 25 is when I picture kind of a more um, significant change in the process. And then the next couple fiscal years are going to be about refining the methodology until we can get to something that um, is um, established. And so, you know, per parameters might change, but the process is is clear and the guidance is, um, you know, not going to be changing materially year over year. Sounds like a long time. Um, part of the reason for that is we envision a definite need for a rule change, which is not a, a fast thing to do. We also may need um, some statutory changes. We're still trying to kind of explore that, but um, that's part of what the, the timeline is. And also I've worked for state government long enough to know that um, that that I should uh, not overpromise anything. <laughs> it takes a long time to move some of these measures and, and uh, things along. Um, so uh, Mathematica has uh, had one-on-one -on -one interviews with all the board members at this point and are currently engaging with all of the CFOs for confidential interviews to get their feedback about the current regulatory approach. Uh, we'll be sharing kind of some um, preliminary feedback early next month um, with you board members, but also with uh, um, the CFOs just so they can kind of um, see 
where <laughs> where things are kind of sugaring out at that point. Um, we also, uh, I don't know if that's happened yet or not, but uh, there's an interview with the healthcare advocate as well. And we will be collaborating with um, all sorts of folks in this endeavor, including the healthcare advocate, um, the Department of Financial Regulation. We're hoping to try to um, learn from some of their expertise in financial regulation in the state to see what, what lessons we can uh, apply here. Um, the Agency of Human Services, um, both um, from the healthcare reform standpoint, but also from their um, health insurer um, role as a payer for Medicaid. We'll also be working with other health insurers and then healthcare consumers because those those um, outcomes that matter, um, obviously they have a say in. <laughs> uh, we do, I think I already said this, we're anticipating um, some changes to the rule. Um, there's some things in there such as, you know, the current rule um, says if we have hearings, we can only exempt up to four hospitals. Um, that may or may not make sense. It may make more sense to have hearings when there's, um, you know, an issue to deliberate and have that not be the, the the standard rule. But that's the type of thing we're going to be delving into over the next three months uh, and beyond. <laughs> Uh, and so there's this little old Act 167 that also has some related duties um, to this work. Um, so the first one is the development of value-based payments. Um, this is something that will be completed in collaboration with uh, the Agency of Human Services and uh, must uh, leverage a stakeholder process that they're already using um, in terms of the next uh, all-payer model work. Uh, we also are on the hook to determine how to incorporate value-based payments into our hospital budget regulation. That's something you know we ought to do anyway as a regulator. Um, financial health um, theoretically should be agnostic to where the money's coming from, you know, that 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 should just to, but, but if there are other things that we want to think about doing special about alternative payment models, we need to think through that um, as part of that work. Um, and just an important bullet in that statute is that um, that work must include an assessment of how this regulatory process will impact Vermont's hospitals um, from a financial sustainability standpoint. And also says that we're look we are to look for opportunities to improve their financial health. So that that's uh that's one that was in there. Uh, we also uh, are need to recommend a methodology to determine an allowable rate of growth for hospital budgets in Vermont. And finally, consider the appropriate role for global budgets um, for Vermont hospitals. So um, all this seems pretty easy and straightforward. No, I'm just kidding. This is an incredibly <laughs> challenging amount of work. Um, that uh, I look, it's exciting work, but it's gonna, you know, thinking back to 1975, like, you know, I, I don't expect to solve this in my 20 year career, but I hope to make a dent. <laughs> the, the rest of, I have 20 years of my career theor theoretically left, uh, unless I get hit by a bus. So anyway, I'm sorry, I'm very rambly today. Um, what questions can I answer for you, board? Ms. Lindbergh, we're not letting you out of here in 20 years. Your 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 sentence is a little bit longer than that, unfortunately for you, and good for us. Um, thank you very, very much for your presentation and your work on this presentation. Um, so yes, any board questions or comments? All right, I, I don't have any myself. Um, oh, go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Owen. Um, so I just want to take a moment um, to say thanks. This is really strong work. Uh, your depth of experience and thinking here um, is just a real asset to us. And I wanted to call out a couple places where you mentioned <clears throat> including um, Vermonters in this process. And I just want, um, I think that's really important when in other in other roles, I've made an effort to always include patients if it's clinical work or um, just this, uh, the, the other people, whether they're business leaders, municipality leaders. <clears throat> um, I think about trying to find the missing voices who will be affected by the work that's underway and making sure that we're uh, reaching them or reaching out to them. Um, it sometimes doesn't always feel that appropriate or that necessary. But when we've made the effort, it changes the conversation in a good way. 
And so I really hope that we um, renew our efforts and strengthen our efforts to uh, expand the perspectives that we listen to um, in these processes, that we're listening to business leaders, we're listening to municipality leaders who are making decisions about, you know, uh, <laughs> how healthcare affects their city budgets versus how many teachers they can hire. And so th there are a lot of perspectives that we don't routinely receive with the board, and I'd like us to keep trying to find them and bring them in. Um, and you mentioned that in a few places. That's also a big deal when it comes to value-based payments. Getting into the nitty gritty with value-based, I think of value as outcomes that matter to patients. That's the, that's the numerator. And so making sure that we are um, getting outcomes and making sure that they do matter to the people that we serve. Uh, I think um, that hasn't been um, as strong as I'd like. So I hope we continue to move uh, toward getting better outcome information. So just wanted to um, reiterate some of the things you said and try to um, add on top so we keep moving in this, the direction that you're outlining. Thank you very much. Chair Foster, can I ask a question related to um, Board Member Walsh's comment? Please. I'm just actually wondering, Sarah, how we're going to go about, uh, do, you, um, do you know the process yet by which Mathematica is going to be reaching out to consumers to get that patient feedback? Will we be working through the healthcare advocate or is there some other mechanism to get that insight? Yeah, I think that's a, the healthcare advocates kind of my place to start. And I think from there, if there's other resources or individuals that we tap into, like, yeah, I think that makes all the sense in the world. Okay, thank you. And, I, you know, I just have a comment actually after that. I just, you know, I really want to tell you thank you also as well. And I'm really excited about this hospital budget process reboot. You probably know that I'm very excited about this. Uh, I really think it's time that we, you know, find ways to streamline it and, you know, to, to the degree that we can limit some of the data requests of hospitals, if we can otherwise obtain that information through the cost reports and other sources, that's really helpful. Um, it also allows for what I like about that is it allows for some standard uh, across hospital, you know, the same source versus some interpretation of what the data request is. I understand there's still some, there's still interpretations when hospitals submit information to cost reports, but there's a bit more standardization potentially in some of those um, vehicles. And, you know, I think as we're really envisioning potentially new payment models, as this slide indicates, it makes sense to revisit how we're doing assessments of hospital budgets. So I think what I'm most interested in is hearing what Mathematica's recommendations are for these objective benchmarks, right, that we can start to use to assess and compare hospital efficiency and cost and price and affordability and access and quality, um, looking to their insights as they've scanned the landscape out there for how we assess hospitals on a comparative basis. I think it's going to be helpful. And to the degree, I know the timeline looks long. It looked long to me. I will say it looked long to me, but I think, you know, thoughtful evaluation and improvement takes time. So we have to be patient if we're going to get it right. Um, and I imagine we'll have some changes already in place in March when you come back with some of um, the staff recommendations for the guidance. So we'll, we're already moving down the path of improvement. So thank you for your hard work and for the team's hard work. I know there's a, there's a village back there that's helping you. So thank you to the entire team for this work. I just had a quick comment as well, um, just somewhat echoing Tom and actually reflecting on it while he was speaking. I was going to comment on, I, you know, with regards to all the questions that you put up on that slide, Sarah, the uh, the goals that the Green Mountain Care Board should have with regards to the hospital budget review process. I think that this, my, my thought on seeing that is this is an area that I'd like to sort of crowdsource some other people's ideas on that. And it sounds like Mathematica is doing that uh, in somewhat of a, um, a private, anonymous way. But I would, I would also love to use our public comment process and and really seek public comment for, from, you know, Vermonters, legislators, business owners, you know, uh, providers, uh, you know, individuals, and in you know, hospital systems, individual hospitals, practice groups. I mean, there's so many different. Uh, uh, you know, AHS, DFR, P 
payers. There's so many stakeholders in this, patient advocates, uh, mental health advocates, other other advocates. Um, if as, as much public comment as we could receive on this, I think would be really helpful to start to shape how we think of of our role. I think we all have ideas as to what that is, but I, adding that um, input would be so helpful. So anyways, that's my, my one comment. Thanks so much for this and, and all the conversations. Um, I, I think Member Walsh for raising that point because it's actually something I saw was that the interviews are with us, the regulated entities and the healthcare advocate. And then the next point on um, nine mentioned substantial collaboration with some of these other parties. And if there's a process, Ms. Lindbergh, by which we can ensure that we're getting that broader spectrum, um, mm -hmm. including even you know independent practices, primary care, because they all have views too as to how our hospital regulatory process plays out, the ACO, I think that is really important to get the right balance. So um, thank you, Member Walsh and the others for highlighting this. I think it's a really important point. Um, and I, of course, echo everyone's gratitude for your great work and your team's great work. And um, I'll turn it over to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments. Yeah, I'll just say thank you again, Sarah. This is, we look forward to working with you on this process as we have been over the years. And I just want to raise up, I won't opine at length because I think I've made this point before, but the theme of humility throughout this process, I think is really critical. And I think it, I hope it instigates the chain reaction amongst all the folks that are involved in this process. And I support any type of effort to increase community engagement. Uh, I think that's no surprise that our office would be an advocate for that. Um, and would also just put out there that I think if there's any opportunity to expand the form by which public comment is given, not just in a written form, but whether this is town meetings, um, potentially that are able to include interpretation services as well to get as diverse of a range of spectators um, and stakeholder engagement as possible. Um, so, but again, thank you, Sarah, for all the work on this and look forward to work with you. Thank you very much. Um, and timely, we actually have an opportunity for some public comment, which is one of the best parts of these board meetings. Um, we don't have the entire universe of Vermonters here, but there is a substantial number. And so with that, I'll turn it over to public comment for any thoughts on this. Mr. Walter Carpenter, how are you? Good to see you. Please go ahead. Hey, hanging in there. It was a struggle to join this today, but welcome to 2023. <clears throat> my how many years on this board <laughs> um i just have one sort of general comment uh question and then a general comment i echo the humility the comments about the humility part um we talk about affordable i'm curious and this has nothing to do with sarah's report or anything but how do you define affordable and what is affordable to whom and <clears throat> i don't hear that um, everybody says it's affordable, but to whom? You know, because what's affordable to someone on the board is not affordable to someone on the street. So I don't know. <clears throat> That's just a general question comment. Yes, I think it's an important one, and I I do think that um, it's a concept that I feel strongly needs to be um, applicable to each regulatory process, but not confined to it, because I think it is a, you know, it, there's a lot of complex relationships. Uh, so yeah, if someone, <laughs> I don't need to get into a lecture about it, but <laughs> uh, I think those are really, those should be essential questions on our slide, Walter. The, they are, they're really important questions. Thank you, um, and that is an important point. Um, and is there any other questions or comments at this time? Okay, um, Ms. Lindbergh, thank you and your team very much for your presentation and your work on this, and have a good day. Thank you. All right, great. Um, and with that, we uh, will get to um, go back over the health resource allocation plan update. 
with Veronica Fialkowski, our Director of Data Analysis and Management, and Jessica Mendizable, our Data Project Manager here at the board. And board members, if you could act really surprised when you yeah. hear things, just to keep it more uh, real, I'd appreciate it very much. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Mendizable. I'm a member of the data and analytics team at the Green Mountain Care Board and uh, just wanted to give a brief in introduction before I turn it over to Veronica. So the purpose of our presentation today is to provide a review of the work that we've done on the health, re health resource allocation plan uh, and just really educate uh, new board members, new stakeholders and members of the public coming into this work and discuss the next phases of this work. And so um, work on the um, what we like to call HRAP is not complete. It's definitely been underway. And um, as we've completed assessments or projects related to resource planning, we have uh, posted those to our website and shared that information. Um, we, we would definitely welcome any feedback on the information that's been provided to date, but also acknowledge that we have um, more work to do going forward and would engage, you know, our partners um, that we've worked with in the past, as well as any new partners that are doing resource planning around the state. And um, we definitely look forward to that work. So um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Veronica to present the slides and I'll be here after to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, good afternoon. So my name is Veronica Falkowski. I'm on the data and analytics team, um, and I've been with the board for a little over a year. Um, and we'll provide an update on the health resource allocation plan. Um, so the goal of today's presentation is really to provide an overview of ATRAP and what its purpose is. ATRAP evolution, you know, where were we, where are we today, and how has it evolved, and then talk about ATRAP future, um, a vision, a process, and goals. Um, eight, uh, 18 VSA 9405 requires Green Mountain Care Board to develop and maintain the ATRAP. Legis legislature established ATRAP in 2003, and it was updated in 2018. And the legislation requires an inventory of specified services and resources, which includes hospital, nursing home, and other inpatient services, ambulatory care, including primary care services, mental health services, health screening and early intervention services, and services for the prevention and treatment of substance use disorders, home health, and emergency care. Other health resources may include um, personnel, equipment, and infrastructure necessary to address the social determinants of health. The legislation also requires recommendations for the appropriate supply and distribution of healthcare services and for the um, ATRAP to be updated every four years. <clears throat> the purpose of ATRAP, um, this is taken straight out of the statute. I just, it's obviously written clearly and well, so I'll just read it. Um, the purpose of ATRAP is to identify Vermont's critical health needs, goods, and services, and resources, which shall be used to inform the board's regula regulatory processes, cost containment, and statewide quality of care efforts, healthcare payment, and delivery reform initiatives, and any allocation of health resources in the state. And it shall identify Vermont residents' needs for healthcare services, programs, and facilities, the resources that are currently available and what additional resources would be required to meet those needs to make access to these services, et cetera. Um, ATRAP should really bring a variety of information from internal and external partners to provide a snapshot of health needs, resources, equipment, gaps in Vermont. Um, and it's for informing the board's regulatory processes, including certificate of need or the hospital budget process. Um, it's for hospitals and healthcare providers and entities. It's to support, have, be a support of the legislative process. It's for the public. It's for many different uses. So now, <coughs> excuse me, we'll review the ATRAP evolution. Um, so here's a timeline of um, ATRAP, and so we'll go through each 
period or segment. Um, so as stated, um, legislature established ATRAP in 2003. Um, the first ATRAP was published in 2005 and then was updated in 2009. And those two ATRAPs were static reports. Um, the 2009 ATRAP had sections that included a general overview of ATRAP and then data on ambulatory care services, hospital services, mental health and substance use um, services and long-term care services. And then within each of those sections provided recommendations of resource allocation. So then kind of moving ahead in time, uh, there were, in 2017, there were numerous stakeholder meetings to determine how would we like to revise the statute to um, for ATRAP. And so in those stakeholder meetings, it was determined that um, we would like to move away from static inventory and reports and then also utilize more existing data sources. And we'll review those data sources in a little bit. Um, and so those proposals were accepted and um, updated ATRAP statute went into effect in 2018. So in 2019, uh, there, in, and kind of through 2020, 21, 22, uh, there were many uh, things uh, done uh, to kind of have what, what our ATRAP is today. Um, there were stakeholder engagements um, conducted. Uh, there was a transition to web-based ATRAP, um, which provides ATRAP resources versus that static big report. Um, healthcare resource inventory gathering was conducted. And then um, just the updating of many reports um, and analyses, including patient migration, utilization, and others. I think it's important to address that in this time, the COVID-19 pandemic response started. And so many of those stakeholders and hospitals, the you know people that we work with to understand our needs and gaps and inventories and equipment were devoted to the response um, as the whole, you know, much of the whole state was. So ATRAP today, it's a series of dynamic reports, visualizations, and other user-friendly tools designed to convey information. And these tools are found on our website, which I'll show in a little bit. ATRAP identifies healthcare services and gaps in availability or accessibility and considers the underlying health needs across communities in Vermont. And GMCB continues to analyze healthcare needs, resources, and utilization patterns across hospital service areas to support regulatory decisions. So ATRAP data sources, I think I often hear, oh, the ATRAP data as if it's one source. It's important to understand that it's not. It's um, um, many entities across the state working and conducting uh, analyses that help us understand the current resources, needs, and gaps. And so it's really the ATRAP includes work from GMCB, the health department, VAS, DIVA, and other partners. You know, there are um, a number of healthcare data sets, databases, resources, which can be used to measure and evaluate supply distribution, um, but they're not just at GMCB. Even though GMCB does steward two of those health data resources, the hospital, date, the hospital discharge data set, and the all player claims data. But although those are useful to understanding some of this, they're not, they don't tell the whole story. And so it is really important for this to be collaborative and use um, all the work happening in the state. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board has worked with stakeholders throughout this process. Early stages included conversations on statewide planning, already underway, priority areas to consider, as well as format and presentation discussions. We learned very quickly that measurement of need is highly nuanced and often the gap fly within with workforce and care coordination. But we realized that planning for these areas during the pandemic is 
very challenging. And so we focused efforts during this time frame um, on analysis relevant to the board's work related to sustainability and utilization patterns. Um, this is a simple graphic, but I think it's a nice graphic to kind of just understand what ATRAP is. It's really, you know, a health resources and equipment inventories and needs assessment and community profiles. It's different analyses from healthcare utilization to migration to whatever, and coming from all sorts of different data resources to make ATRAP. Um, so um, the ATRAP website is housed on the board's web pages, um, and it's currently organized by healthcare resources, community needs, um, and assessments, and then a number of other public reports. Here's just a few screenshots of some of the data that's available um, under the ATRAP pages. Some, like the um, map on the left, are more static. Uh, reports or images. For example, this is from the oral health inventory, so it's dental care services across the state. Other um, resources on, under the ATRAP, ATRAP pages are more um, interactive or dynamic dashboards. Um, these two examples include a patient migration dashboard or primary care access dashboard. Uh, so just wanted to highlight a few recent updates. Um, for what ATRAP is today. Um, and this is uh, definitely not an exhaustive list. It is just a few highlights. Um, so the patient migration analysis was recently updated and that's done by the Green Mountain Care Board. The hospital market report was recently updated. It used to be the patient origin report that GMCB conducted, but with this new hospital market report, FAS NSO conducts the um, analyses. Uh, Blueprint Community Health Profile data by HSA um, was updated by DIVA. And then these healthcare inventories that were done in 2019 and 2020, right at the start of the pandemic is when they were being finalized. Um, those were conducted by us and partners. So as we kind of come to the end of what I'm gonna consider this cycle for the four years, um, we can start beginning, begin thinking about what is the next four years going to look like as we think about updating ATRAP. And some of that work has already started. So this year we began doing requirements gathering for ATRAP specific to the regulatory processes and the teams on at Green Mountain Care Board. So, so far we've talked to the certificate of need um, team and the hospital budget team. And it's really to understand how do they use the ATRAP, but then how does their work that they do inform the ATRAP as well? So the future. So these are the visions. Um, none of this, most of these are not new, but I think they're important when considering the future. Um, so ATRAP should capture what is happening in the state in terms of healthcare accessibility, quality, and cost and how we wanna allocate our healthcare resources. Um, it should deliver up-to-date, sustainable, dynamic resources that enables more informed healthcare or health resource allocation decision making across Vermont using data. Focus on the needs of each regulatory process of the Green Mountain Care Board. Provide ad hoc analysis for different needs and questions that arise that are not captured by the current ATRAP. I think this is important. ATRAP can't answer everything. And so if the, uh, questions arise because you know things change, uh, we need to have the ability to be able to do ad hoc analysis to answer those questions. Um, we wanna foster a collaborative process. So as I, hopefully um, I've shown that this is a, a collaborative uh, process. Um, it's a collaborative tool. And so we need to be able to share, um, kind of capture other work that other entities are doing and have a process in doing so. And then develop a tool or tools that help, that allow to navigate these, the variety of these reports by HSA or whatever other 
to, you know, topic or geographic area um, to understand health resources and needs to support our regulatory process. Um, with the change of in statute in 2018, going from a static report to more dynamic reports, I think it's important to remember that this is now an ongoing process. There's really not a, a start and a final, here's a report. Um, it is kind of a cyclical process that well, never ends. Um, so there's requirements gathering, there's stakeholder engagement, there's data collection, analysis, and reporting, and then visualizing and packaging that information. And it keeps going. These are just some considerations by like high level topic areas. So kind of the structure of ATRAP in the sense of how our priority is going to be uh, developed or decided on. And so using the new state health improvement plan that will be coming out in the next year or so by our regulatory needs at GMCB. I've said this already, but revising the process to ensure work across the state is included um, in terms of stakeholder engagement, uh, you know, having recommendations for resource allocation, how do we determine how to best, do, um, do, you know, use those resources in an effective and efficient manner, and then visualization, how to package data on our web page. Um, is it going to be dashboards? Is it going to be by topic, HSA? What is the most useful uh, for our audiences? So this is a, a roadmap, if you will, um, of goals and next steps. So some of this will be a little repetitive to what I just said, but um, I will review them. So we want to finalize our um, GMCBD, excuse me, GMCB regulatory process requirements gathering. So finish talking to ev all everyone to understand how they use ATRAP and how they can inform ATRAP, communicate the stakeholder engagement process, determine a process to enhance ability to provide ad hoc analysis not captured by ATRAP. I think this is a one of the more important ones, which is explore more sustainable ways to update resource inventories and collect data from hospitals in the least burdensome way. Uh, regardless of COVID-19 response or not, we're, everyone is busy. <laughs> Hospitals are busy. Providers are busy. Um, the, you know, we, we don't want to be burdensome. We want to have useful information. And it also, you know, not only be sustainable in how we collect it, but up to date, you know, if it's a resource list from five years ago, is that useful? I mean, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Kind of probably depends on how quickly things change, but we do know things change. So um, we need to explore that. Um, develop a process for providing resource allocation recommendations. So who's who makes those recommendations? How? How are they updated? When? Et cetera. And then um, this is a relatively simple one, but I think um, provides will we'll provide more transparency, which is just map when and how ATRAP components are updated. So there's so much, so many reports that kind of feed in to what ATRAP is, and they all are updated on a different cycle, um, or maybe they were a one-time report. So just having that and understanding that and when to anticipate some of those updates, I think would be important. And then just a reminder that this is a cyclical and ongoing process, um, and we welcome feedback, like Jessica had said in the, uh, beginning and wanted this to be a useful tool for everyone. Take questions now. Thank you guys very much. Um, I'll turn it over to my other board members for any questions or comments they may have. I'll jump in. I just want to say thanks to Veronica and Jess. Um, having been involved in this in the past, it's you know, the inventories in particular are a lot of work and a shout out to Donna for that as well, because she worked hard on those. Um, I, I think it's good to reboot and take a step back and try and figure out how to move forward in a useful way, because I think that's quite frankly, always been a challenge with the HRAP since the beginning is how do you ensure that um, you're not duplicating uh, efforts that other state agencies are making? Certainly the Department of Health has you know, terrific data 
uh, capabilities and does a lot of analysis on needs and they're in charge of doing um, you know, certain needs related assessments. It does, we don't have the people or the capacity to duplicate everybody else's job. So I think um, you've done a great job of trying to pull in all, what's happening in all the different agencies in one place. Um, so thank you for that. And I look forward to hearing more as we move forward with the next cycle. Ms. Walsh, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Jess. Thank you, Veronica. I'll second what Robin was saying. You know, listening to this, the, the thought occurred to me that I, we hear um, sustainability a lot, and I think that that's, that's a very important aspect. Um, one thing that I haven't heard a lot, but I've seen great examples of in other places where it's not so much, it's responsiveness and agility. Right. Um, during COVID, we saw how adaptable and responsive our healthcare system can be. There were pop-up vaccination clinics. Um, people mobilized in a way that um, I think, as time goes by, we'll look back and see. Um, you know, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect, but more and more, it was incredibly impressive. Right. Um, and given that. Um, that's kind of juxtaposed with um, this slow uh, epidemic of mental health stresses, substance use disorders, and suicides that prior to the pandemic, those were all on the rise. During the pandemic, they did not abate, it got worse. As the pandemic is fading, it continues to worsen. The data in our state is that we're we're on track this year to eclipse the record we set last year. We have no pop-up clinics for mental health services. We haven't built our capacity, changed on a dime to try to address those concerns. And so I think of, we've, set, we've had during other parts of the presentation, like a slow, steady approach is, is needed, particularly from, from regulators, but, I wonder if part of the HRAP, the, what we could be looking at is how do we improve our agility to meet the demands of Vermonters, the needs of them? Because um, those are changing faster than our healthcare delivery system has been able to change. And it just seems like that could be, there could be some paragraphs ab about that and some thoughtfulness about it. So um, that occurred to me while listening to you and I thank you for provoking my thinking it was an engaging presentation about something that could be a bit dry. So um, thank you for your work and thank you for sharing it with us. Any other board member questions or comments? Ms. Holmes? Yeah, I just had uh, actually two quick questions. Um, thank you also. We always echo each other's uh, gratitude, but I mean that sincerely here. Um, I think you mentioned that the HRAP team was working with the hospital budget team to optimize this tool, understand how the information was flowing back and forth between the two. And I'm wondering, uh, given the presentation we just had, whether Mathematica is also exploring how this HRAP tool will could potentially tie into the hospital budget reboot. So I'm thinking, for example, of the patient migration and hospital market reports feeding directly. How can that feed directly into the board's assessment of hospital budgets? Um, can in, in the opposite direction like will we will you use the hospital budget process to request the hrap inventory updates um you know that we need to keep that data dynamic and up to date so i'm just wondering if mathematic is also involved in thinking about how to optimize the use of this tool to improve the hospital budget process um i can answer that and I don't know if Sarah Lindbury had to run but she can chime in um it's definitely a part of that contract work and we considered it when we wrote the contract um and I think um that's exactly right like how can we automate some of that data collection around services where that was very manual process with hospitals um in years past and 
Um, we've definitely asked them to have a look at that. I don't think that that work has started yet. Sarah, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but one other thing that I just wanted to throw out there is, um, Jess, you mentioned the um, non-financial non reporting requirements, and that's an opportunity to, to maybe reduce the burden at time of budget submission, but turn back to some data collection that could help support ETRAP. Um, so I just wanted to... I heard that and I remembered that's yeah. when we used to want that that's when we used to ask for that information. And so maybe we could uh consider that as well. Perfect. That sounds great. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Um and then I guess my, my last question is really I'm wondering, you know, in this process as we're reimagining what this H wrap looks like and it's a dynamic process and we're kind of rebooting this as well coming out of COVID. I'm wondering if in the staff's research, we've you've come across any other states that do anything similar to HRAP, and is there a source of inspiration out there that we could be using to come up with a really dynamic, useful tool for resource allocation? Or is Vermont really just out ahead of all these other states and trying to do this? Um, so that's a great question, and I'll let others answer as well if they know. I did Google, <laughs> um, you know, health resource allocation planning words around that um, at a state level. And there really isn't anything quite like this that I could find, um, which makes it challenging because it's nice to bounce ideas off of other states. So um, if others do know of other states doing something similar and you know maybe are using different language and, and can't say I spent a ton of time looking, but um, I think that would be helpful. Great, thank you so much. For what it's worth, I've never heard of another state doing it. I mean, certainly countries do like real resource planning, which this quite frankly is not. Uh, I don't think this is meant to be that other quite otherwise, quite frankly, it would be staffed and funded. Um, but I think so. I think it is kind of a unique animal. Yeah, yeah, it's more of a a resource of resources of understanding what we have and where we're at and what our needs are. I, I have a few questions, comments. One is I, I think it's great that this is merged into or morphed into being a far more dynamic document. I mean, it, it, health resources are not static. So a static document every four years seems archaic in this day and age. So. I'm, I'm very happy about about that. It it sounds like there's going to be some complexity complexity with its being dynamic and how it's then applied into standards, but uh, that seems something that should be worked through because of its necessity that it is dynamic. So, um, the the other question I have, and, and maybe for this is for Jess, is what's the relationship between the Act 167 hospital sustainability work and the HRAP? You know, it seems like there's some overlap and scope there maybe different ways of looking at similar problems. Was that this Jess? Okay. Uh, um, well, or either Jess, I guess. No, I think, uh, I think that's exactly right. And the more we dive into the Act 167 work, the more I realize that um, ATRAP might inform that work and vice versa. Act 167 received funding and to the extent that um, we look at services and capacity by hospital service area. That's exactly what each rep is. Is that was the hope, um, and to have that um, to have that work take place now, uh, you know, it would update any of the work that we had done earlier on. Um, and so I think that so I I do think that there's overlap there. Other other folks, feel free to chime in. I guess the reason why I ask is, is there a way we can leverage to use them together in a sustainable way in the future? But I, I, I don't think that's really, that's more of a rhetorical question, trying to figure out, you know, how, how those will blend over time than to ask you that specifically now. So thanks. Um, thank you both very much for your time in the presentation. Every time I hear some of the work of the data team, it reminds me I want to go speak with the data team more, and there's a lot to learn. You guys do really phenomenal work. Um, I have been on the website, and I encourage others to go on the website because the data information is really interesting. Um, I have it up now, and it gives you, for example, primary care access data 
including how many physician assistants or primary care providers there are per 100,000 people. It gives it to you for each health service area. It gives it to you on a statewide average basis, the maximum, the minimum. So you can really compare and see what we have available in different parts of the state. Um, the patient migration report gives you the last five years of what costs have looked like for commercial, Medicare, and Medicaid, and it gives you a sense of um, where costs are going up and and for which payers. So it's really it's really fascinating data. And I can see, I, I think, I forget if it's Jess or Robin, the point about uh, considering this or looking at this data in connection with the hospital budget process is, is really a good point. So I encourage the public and everyone else to look at it because it's very, very informative about the state of our state's healthcare system. Um, and I'll turn it over to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments that they ha may have. Thank you, Veronica and Jessica. Appreciate all the work on this. Uh, one quick question and then a brief comment. Uh, the question is, I wonder how feasible, and I imagine you've already thought about this, but I wonder how feasible it would be to look on the back end to see what reports and tools are being used most frequently um, through the HRAP and which ones are maybe less frequently utilized as, you know, one of, I'm sure, many metrics thinking about rebooting and reforming. Um, so I just wondered if that was possible. Um, and then the comment, one, one just brief comment is, during COVID, uh, the Oregon Health Authority also did a health resource allocation plan somewhat. It's much more narrow in scope. Um, it's not, I mean, I agree that there isn't really another state that I've seen that does this type of work, but they did have an interesting um, tool, particularly about prioritizing health equity during kind of a resource scarce environment. So I, I would just um, recommend that tool. It's, it's interesting. Um, and they also do a really great job with language. They've translated it into like 30 different languages, which is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to make those two points. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll have to go look at that. And um, in terms of the comment on looking at, you know, the utilization of some of these reports, um, I'm not exactly sure what our um, web page, like web page capabilities are. I'm sure there is something. I think the challenge with that is some of a lot of the resources that we do provide are not our work it's we're linking to other people's work um, but when we're thinking of stakeholder engagement um, we can consider you know what is of these reports the most looked at most useful that we can leverage more so thank you thank you okay, and i'll turn it over to public comment um, please use the raise your hand function if there's any public comment Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Veronica and, and Jess. And nice to see you both. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to the board to see if there's any old business to come before the board. Any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved or seconded. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.